Extreme makeovers. Extreme makeovers, having read John chapter 18, verses 33 through 37. Would you bow your heads with me? King Jesus, we love you. We thank you, God, for your word. We thank you, God, today for the opportunity to be in the house of God, to hear from you, to receive from your spirit. God, we ask tonight, Lord, that you'd allow your anointing to rest upon your servant, God, that I might deliver the message you've placed upon my heart for this hour. For, Lord, tonight, this is an important instructional message, something we need to know, for it's an important truth, and we know that, Lord, the truth is only heard by those who know Jesus Christ in truth. And, Lord, we know you in truth tonight. Help us, Lord, to receive the message as you'd have us receive it, that we might leave this place changed and challenged, different than we came in, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated tonight. We've read John chapter 18, verses 33 through 37 tonight. And I want to talk to us briefly, won't take too long, on the topic of extreme makeovers. And you say, well, I don't know how in the world you get extreme makeovers out of the text that we've just read. You know, so many women will marry a man believing that they have the magic touch that will turn that man from an abusive and rough-hewn clump of coal into a diamond and a prince. Many believers approach the gospel as though it were a prescription for the ills of this world, all of its injustices, all of its inequities to remedy. But that is not the purpose nor the intent of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was not the Lord's purpose while he walked on the surface of this planet Earth, and it is not supposed to be the purpose of his church. We make a fatal error in judgment tonight, saints, when we approach the gospel of grace in a manner that reduces it to a social message, an extreme makeover, if you will, for the world in which we live. How many preachers you hear on television represent the gospel of Jesus Christ as being an extreme makeover? Amen? It's going to change you. You're not going to be the same person. You're supernaturally going to become somebody that you weren't before you came to church tonight is what they'll tell you. So many people re represent the gospel of Jesus Christ as being the, uh, the pill that is going to end all the ills of the world. It'll bring peace. It'll bring harmony. It'll bring happiness. It'll bring holiness. It'll do all these wonderful things, and the world will be different. But tonight I want the church of God to understand that the gospel of Jesus Christ has never been, nor will it ever be, a social message. It's not about fixing the problems of this world. It's about fixing the problem of your soul. It's not about fixing the ills of our society. It is about fixing the ills of your spiritual condition. It is not about changing the way that humanity lives on the face of planet Earth, but it's changing the way that those who believe approach life while here on planet Earth. So many people, I, I always am amazed at how many preachers and how many saints do not understand what Jesus said here in the book of John that we've read tonight. They don't understand what the Lord was saying. My kingdom is not of this world. This is not what I'm here for. This is not the purpose in my coming. So many people want to... Uh, believe tonight that if only Christianity could control the White House, if only Christianity could control the uh, Supreme Court, if only Christianity could control this or that, all the ills of the world would be wiped away, and all the goodness of God would be shed forth upon the, upon the face of this planet. That is an unrealistic goal. It is not God's goal. It is not God's plan. And children, if we're not careful, we can fall into the same mindset. I told you, tonight's kind of like a teaching uh, message more so than a preaching message. But I want you to know something. There are organizations and, and ministries and churches tonight that are lining up, unknowingly lining up 
for the arrival of the Antichrist. Because they're so worried about changing the condition of this world. They're so obsessed with perfecting this world and making it a better place and making it all that it could be. And I want you to know tonight that at this very moment in time, the only concern God has with any one of us in this room is us. It's not about the world. It's not about whether there are gays and lesbians marching down the streets of any particular given city. It's not about whether or not abortion is running rapid in our society. It's not about all the big issues. It's about the little issue. It's about you and God. That's what God's really concerned about. He's worried about you and I tonight. He's not worried about the big things. He's concerning himself with the little things. He's got what they call a grassroots movement going on. Amen. Which means that he's not up at the top of the heap trying to do things. He's down where the little people are trying to do things. I love the old song that says, How big is God? How big and vast is the domain? To try to tell, these lips can only start. He's big enough to rule this mighty universe. And he's small enough to live within my heart. Pilate asked the Lord, are you a king then? He said, is that what you're, he said, that's what you said about me. You've already acknowledged that I'm a king. I've got news for you. If Pilate and many of the political men of his time and those who just preceded him, if they didn't know who Jesus was, Jesus wouldn't have been standing in that room that day. You remember that the wise men who came inquiring about the baby that was born, for they'd seen a star in the east. You'll remember that Herod inquired of them, when did you first see this star? When did this first appear to you? Because Herod knew what the prophecy of the Jewish people were. And it wasn't, didn't matter to Herod whether God was real or God was dead. What mattered to Herod was that the Jewish people might believe it. <laughs> And if they believed the king was born, it could be problematic. And Herod decided, well, we'll kill all the children then that are two years and younger because these men said that the star appeared two years ago, thinking that he would cut this perceived king off at the pass. But you know something? The Lord declared to Pilate this day in John, my kingdom is not of this world. It's so important today for believers and saints to understand this truth. It's not about bringing God's kingdom down to planet Earth and redoing planet Earth and making planet Earth into what we believe God, ought, uh, God wants it to be. You hearing me now? God doesn't want to bring himself down. He wants to lift you up. The Bible says that we're made to sit in heavenly places with the Lord. God's not interested tonight in coming down to where we are. God is interested in lifting us up to where He is. That's why when Jesus Christ left, uh, before He left, He said, Hey, I'm going away, but if I go, I will prepare a place for you, that where I am, there ye may be also. He said, I am not preparing something here for you, because I'm preparing something there for you. I don't plan on being where you are. I plan on taking you to where I am. Amen. You say, well, does that mean there won't be a makeover? Oh, no, there's going to be a makeover. But if we're not careful, and if we try to use the gospel of Jesus Christ as a license for making over the world, we literally will become tonight subject to an antichrist Mentality. Wow, that was a powerful statement. And it came off my lips before I even realized I said it, and I'm not kidding. That, that's how the anointing sometimes works, especially a prophetic anointing. God will have you say something, and then I'll sit here and say, holy mackerel, did I just say that? Hold my word. Because when you try to make the gospel of Jesus Christ about his kingdom on earth, you're working against him. 
because his kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. <laughs> and you now become an enemy of the cross rather than an advocate of the cross. Wow. So many of these preachers today that are out there preaching about uh, every sin on earth that they perceive as being sin and, and how much uh, the, world, uh, the uh, world needs to change and how much the government needs to change and how that the White House needs to do this and how the Supreme Court needs to do that. No, what the White House needs to do is repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and Mr. Bush can receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. What the Supreme Court needs to do tonight is to repent, to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, and they, those nine people, can also receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. They do not need to remake this world to accommodate God. God has accommodated one person at a time when we make up our minds to live for Him. And He doesn't need our help making over the world got news for you. According to biblical prophecy, when the Lord decides to make this thing over, it's going to get made over. You're not going to stand in the way. You're not going to stall it. You're not going to stop it. You're not going to stump it. You are going, my friend, not to have any effect on what God is doing. God's going to do what God's going to do. But in the meantime, we've got to remember, my kingdom is not of this world. So stop trying, saints and believers out there. Stop trying to make over the world. Stop trying to perform extreme makeovers. Stop walking up to people and saying, God doesn't like you who you are. God doesn't like you the way that you are. You need to be made over. We need to rework you and redo you and make you look and act different than you do. What you need to understand is God does understand that person. God does accept that person. God does welcome that person. God can change the heart of that person. But what's on the outside may still look and act very much the same as it did before. But what's on the inside will have experienced a tremendous, powerful transformation. And it'll never be the same again. Amen. Isn't that lovely? Praise God, because what's on the inside is what is preparing for what God is going to do when that extreme makeover finally one day does indeed occur in this world. Jesus said in Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, I've preached on this recently, you've heard me many times mention this, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. My kingdom is not of this world. My ministry is not about the, the condition of our society. It is about the condition of men's souls. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not at all about changing the world in which we live. It's about changing the lives of those who must, for a season, live here. So many wish to use the teachings and practices of Christ as a model for a social gospel that is intent on bringing justice to those for whom it has been denied, prosperity to those who have been otherwise neglected by circumstance, and opportunity to those who haven't had the means to make opportunities for themselves in the areas of health, education, and employment. But the gospel of Jesus Christ is not an excuse to turn God's people into social workers. The first need of humanity remains to this day the soul of humanity. Eternity and the ultimate quest for a knowledge of God remain today at the highest level of priority for the human family. Amen. Did you hear me today? Eternity should still be our highest priority. Not what's going on here on earth, but eternity. Matthew 5, 3 through 12 
so many love to twist this portion of Scripture to make it seem like the Lord is somehow advocating that the church become a bunch of social workers trying to change the face of our society and change the face of the world in which we live. It's commonly referred to as the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Then say when they're saying all manner of evil against you and you earned every bit of it. Amen. When people stand up and say, Jerry Falwell's a loudmouth jackass who's opinionated, ignorant, and homophobic, honey, there's no false accusation there. Amen. They're telling the truth. You've earned those accolades. But Jesus says, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely, falsely, for my sake. See, when you're acting like the church is supposed to act and behave, behaving like the people of God are supposed to be behaving, you're not judging people. You're not condemning people. All you do is letting them know that the grace of God is available to them. If they want to come in, the ark is open. Amen. And when you're behaving like that, if they have something bad to say about you, it's on them. It's not on you. Hello now. But when you get up in the pulpit and condemn everybody for everything from putting on their socks wrong to combing their hair in the wrong place, then, honey, you've earned the negative comments that you get. You earn the persecution that you receive. And when you're persecuted for the foolishness that you engage in, you deserve it. It's only, the Lord said, we're only blessed when we are reviled and persecuted falsely. When you're treated as evildoers, when in reality, you're trying your best to do what God has called you to do, and you're doing it the right way. When you create an organization that has teachings that cause you to become reviled by the world, and they look upon you as a bunch of nuts and fruits and goofballs, because members of your organization and members of your church are dying for lack of a blood transfusion or because uh, people within your organization have to run around with their hair piled upon their head all the way to the ceiling in order to be considered saved and part of the kingdom of God. Then, honey, when people make in front of you, do not sit there and just, you know, gobble up all the attention. Oh, glory to God, I'm being persecuted for the cause of the gospel. I'm being persecuted represent Jehovah. I'm being persecuted represent Jesus. Honey, you're being persecuted for being an income pool. Amen. Your own stupidity brought it on you. You're not being persecuted for God's sake. You're not being persecuted because of God. You're being persecuted because of your own stupidity. Amen. And if you think you're going to stand before the Lord and he's going to heap blessings upon you in eternity because you're an idiot on earth, it won't happen. Amen. I want you to know God expects us to have more brains than wrong in this life. Amen. And he expects us to use the brains we've got. He expects us to use the intelligence that he's given us. <laughs> Even in the Old Testament, God said, come, let us reason together. Meaning, God appeals to our intellect and says, come on now, hey, for God's sake, use your head for a minute. Does that make sense? Does that add up? When you teach this and you teach that, does that really add up? How can
can you on one hand say that a blood transfusion as an example it's just the one that happens to be at the top of my head at the moment that a blood transfusion is going to condemn somebody because it, it, it's on the same lines as idolatry because you're consuming blood no you're not consuming blood come on think for a minute folks come on use your head for just a second I've never seen anybody get a blood transfusion that goes through the stomach. Amen. I've never seen a blood transfusion given to anybody via the stomach. To consume blood requires that it go through the mouth and into the stomach. Right. Think. It's easy. It all takes a little bit of brains, right? And yet Jesus said, greater love has no man than this, than he lay down his life for a friend. When you can save a person's life without having to kill yourself to do it, that's a wonderful gift. When somebody can save your life by giving a pint of blood to a stranger that they don't even know, but they care enough about humanity to donate it, that's a wonderful gift. There's nothing evil in that. Now, you can sit there and twist it and turn it all you want to, try to make it look evil, try to make it act evil, try to make it sound evil, but it's not evil. Right. Amen. I'm not worshiping the blood. I'm not bowing down in front of the blood. I'm not pouring the blood over an altar. I'm not pouring the blood over a sacrifice. I'm not extracting the blood from a sacrifice. So it has absolutely nothing to do with idolatry. So if you're part of an organization or a church or a fellowship or whatever you want to call it that teaches something so foolish as this and you wind up in court because your child's life could have been saved if you would have simply given them a blood transfusion, you earn the garbage you get. You earn the attention you get. You earn everything you've got because you were stupid and foolish and couldn't use your own mind that God gave you to think straight and to do the right thing. My Lord, have mercy. I don't know where that came from. I really don't. Finally tonight, the Lord said in Matthew 5, I've already read the first uh, few verses, but verse 12, he said, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. My kingdom is not of this world. If you notice everything Jesus said in the Beatitudes, he talked about situations here in the temporal that resulted in blessing in the eternal. Why? Because my kingdom is not of this world. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for hallelujah, one day they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, because one day they shall inherit the earth. Oh, blessed are all these people who in this life have done dirty and who are treated poorly and who are accused falsely because in the eternal there will be great reward for them is what Jesus said. Why? Because my kingdom is not of this world. It's not about reworking the way that our society does things. It's not about redoing earth. It's not about recreating this creation of God. It's about every man and every woman coming to a place of faith and obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We've got many well-meaning Christian organizations out there today that are trying desperately to feed the poor and to help the hungry. They want to change the world in which we live, and they use the gospel of Jesus Christ as the vehicle whereby they claim they're going to do it, appealing to Christian charity, appealing to Christian uh, uh, care and concern for other human beings. But you know what? My kingdom is not of this world. It's not about remaking the earth. i got news for you. Jesus said something that is so plain and simple that you cannot possibly misinterpret what he said in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 11. For you have the poor with you always. Period. Case closed. He said you'll always have the poor with you. 
No matter how hard you try to stamp out hunger all over the face of the planet Earth, I've got news for you. People, somebody, somewhere is going to be hungry. Well, we've got people that call themselves the Christian Children's Fund or whatever it is over there in Ethiopia trying to feed people. There are people right here in America going to bed without food. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not a license to change the world over. It's not a license to go out there and try to recreate and remake in an image that you believe God has, has set forth for this world. No, when it's time for God to remake the world, honey, He's going to remake it. You aren't going to have anything to do with it, and you're certainly not going to be able to slow it down or stop it. Amen? So don't worry about trying to remake the world. Don't worry about trying to make all the queens and the queers straight. That's not your job. Don't worry about trying to feed every single person on the face of the planet. That is not your job. Your job is to help people know that even if you start to death, there is a city that is way for square whose builder and maker is God that you can occupy on the other side of the fence. Hallelujah. And when you close your eyes in death, you can wake up in God's glorified city. My Lord, have mercy. We're so worried about trying to keep them alive for what? So they can do what? Amen. What are they going to do? We keep them alive for a hundred years. What are they going to do? People want to live forever. Everybody wants to live forever. We go to doctors so we can live forever. We think. For what? What are you going to do? Eventually, your body wears out. My great-grandmother, bless her heart, 89 years old. My great-grandmother, Hawksley, 93 years old. As time goes by, children, I've got news for you. The eyes quit working. The organs fail. The senses dim. Isn't it just a good thing to know that while this temporal is not what God's kingdom is all about, that there is something eternal that God's kingdom is all about, and what he wants you to do is to, in the temporal, secure the eternal. Amen. That's what God wants you to do. In the temporal, secure the eternal. Amen. So that Grandma Huxley, when your eyes couldn't see so good anymore and you couldn't read like you used to, couldn't watch television like you used to, couldn't enjoy life like you used to, when you went to sleep in this old world, that Jesus Christ tonight, listen to this now, does not hold the deed to. The world in which we live today, the Lord God Almighty does not hold the deed to this world today. Do you know that? He doesn't hold the deed. He holds the deed to your soul, thank God, so that when you exit this world, you enter His. But he does not today, today, I'm not saying he never will, but I'm saying today he does not possess the deed to this world. Well, Brother Morris, the earth is the Lord's and everything that's in it belongs to God and yada yada yakety yakety yakety. But the Bible tells us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Against spiritual wickedness in high places, my kingdom is not of this world. That's why our battle is not against people in this world. It's not against people who occupy this realm. Our battle is a supernatural battle because the Lord's kingdom is a supernatural kingdom. In Ephesians 2 and 2, the Apostle Paul writes, Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. You see, the prince and power of the prince of the power of the air is Satan. Lucifer today holds the deeds to this world. He got the deed in the planet of, the, of uh, in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve decided to disobey God and do their own thing, they unwittingly passed the writ of possession from God to Lucifer. Because in obeying him and disobeying God, they made him their God. 
That's why the Bible speaks of Satan as the god of this world. Because they passed the deed and said, all right, well, as long as we were under subjection to you, God Jehovah, this world was your possession, it was your creation. But when we decided to obey what Lucifer told us, we handed the deed over to him and said, here, now it's yours. Why do you think that Lucifer could stand up on the pinnacle of the temple with the Lord Jesus Christ and show him all the world and say, it's yours if you want it? Because it was his to get. Did you hear that? It was his to give. And the Lord knew it was his to give. And he knew, well, I can do what the devil said now and get it right now, or I can follow through on the plan that I made before time even began, before the clock ever started ticking. I can do what I had intended from the very get-go and achieve the same end. The only difference is, rather than Winning the prize by cowardice, I will have won it through great effort. I will have won it through great honor. I will have won it through great bravery. I think I'll pick plan B. When my wife looks over at me, I want her to know she's my wife because I work for her. When the bride of Christ looks over at their God in eternity, they're going to know throughout eternity that their God worked for them. Amen. You remember the marriage of uh, Jacob with his two wives, Leah and Rachel. You remember how he was duped into marrying the first one. That's not the one he wanted. But he worked so hard for her, and he wound up with the wrong one. So you know what he did? He quit and said, oh, well, I got one, that's all I need. No, he said, I'll do it again till I get the one I wanted. That's a type tonight of salvation. You have first the law. It's not the one I wanted, but it's the one I got. And then you have the Messiah. It's the one we needed. It's the one we wanted. It's the one we longed for. It's the one we loved. It's the one that from the beginning of time God had planned. Whoa, glory. Do you see the imagery there, huh? Isn't that beautiful? I told you tonight's kind of an instructional message. I'm almost done. Tommy always teases me when I say I'm almost done and I take another 20 minutes. But to me, if I've already gone 30 or 40, and if I'm almost done and I take another 20, that's not bad. It's one thing tonight for the world to roll out the red carpet for the Antichrist, who shall embody all that is evil and opposed to God. But it is something altogether different for the church to do so by not recognizing its true purpose and mission and instead embracing a social agenda which seeks to make over our world and opens the door to this ungodly intruder and impersonator. We as God's people are called to do right, to act in kindness, to be loving and charitable, but we are not called to make over our society and to try and change the world in which we live, seeing as it is presently deeded to the enemy of our souls until such time as the as the Lord our God shall tear that deed from his clothes and hoof at the valley that is called Armageddon. My word have mercy. Till that time, children, it's not our job to engage in extreme makeovers. It's our job to secure eternity. James 2 and 5, listen to what James says about the nature of God's kingdom. Hearken, my beloved, Brethren, have not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to them that love him? It doesn't matter what your temporal situation is. It doesn't matter how broke you are today. Honey, once you cross the bridge into eternity, you'll be richer than your imagination can even begin to help you understand tonight. Because my kingdom is not of this world. It's not about changing everything down here, getting everything down here, having everything down here, making everything down here look and act and sound and smell the way we want it to or the way we believe God wants it to. 
God wants it to do what it's doing. Until he's able to gather his people up out of here and then come back and say, all right, you know what, y'all been in my property long enough. I'm evicting you. Get out of here. You don't belong here. I created this thing, and it's mine, and I'm reclaiming it for my bride, and I'm going to renovate from top to bottom. And then we don't need men like Martin Luther King Jr. anymore. Then we don't need men like Malcolm X anymore. Then we don't need people preaching a social message and using a gospel. It's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the gospel of Muhammad. But they're always using some gospel. They're always using some religion to justify their message. But then we won't need any men like Martin Luther King Jr. to try to help humanity understand equality. We won't need it because God is going to dry up the oceans and there'll be no more division. And we'll be one people. And we'll be one kingdom. And we'll be under one Lord. Amen. So you see, children, while we're so busy trying to remake their honey, you can't do what's necessary to make this earth over the way God's going to make it over. You haven't got enough pumps to dry out the ocean. So that humanity is no longer divided by bodies of water. You haven't got enough pumps yet. Where would you put the water? If you have the pump, where would you put the water? You see, you don't have the power, so why not leave it to God? Just worry tonight about securing your place in eternity. That's what God wants you to do. Revelation. We just talked about the fact that God has chosen the poor of this world to be heirs of his kingdom which is promised to them. But now listen to this wonderful promise, Revelation 21, verses 1 through 4, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. When God remakes this thing, it's going to be made over. But until he does it, you haven't got the power to do what needs to be done. So concentrate on what God wants you to concentrate on, and that is your relationship with him. Amen? Isaiah 64 and 4 tells us, for since the beginning of the world, men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, nor God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. That is literally exactly the verse that Paul quotes in 1 Corinthians 2, chapter 9, when Paul writes, But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. My kingdom is not of this world. I can't see what God has prepared, prepared for me in this world because his kingdom is not of this world. I'll never see what God has prepared for me in this world because his kingdom is not of this world. It's a supernatural kingdom. It's an otherworldly kingdom. He's going to bring his kingdom to planet Earth. Amen. Yes, he is. But until he does, it's my job to secure my place in his kingdom, not to secure his kingdom in my place. Amen. It's my job to secure my place in the kingdom. I cannot secure the place of the entire United States of America in the kingdom of God. I cannot secure the place for every soul in this nation in the kingdom of God. But honey, neither can I secure a place for the kingdom of God in the entire United States of America. 
which is what many preachers and people are trying to do. They want extreme makeovers. They want to redo everything in what they believe to be the image that God has for this nation or for that nation or for this people or that people. And tonight I say, let us concentrate on our relationship with our Creator. Let us work today towards securing our place in eternity because great and wonderful, marvelous things are planned for those of us that will today. Understand this truth. My kingdom is not of this world. The Lord's already got something marvelous for you and I. Amen. It's, it's, not, it's not coming. It's already here. We just haven't seen it yet. We just haven't heard it yet. We just haven't experienced it yet. But he's already got it. Why? Because my kingdom is not of this world. It's already there. And when the new Jerusalem slowly lowers itself from heaven down to planet Earth, God's kingdom is going to meet with planet Earth. And God's going to renovate and create something beautiful and something new for his people. But tonight, our job is not to renovate. It's not to remake. It's not to make over. It's merely to secure our place in his kingdom. Amen? Amen. Would you stand with me tonight? Booby, I told you. I'm almost done, I said. See, I was almost done. Amen. I hope that that word was an encouragement to you tonight. Amen. I told you it's kind of a teaching, preaching thing. But boy, there was some good stuff there, I think. And uh, hopefully you'll take it home with you, contemplate it, think about it, and it will bear fruit unto righteousness. Master, we thank you, God, for this evening. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We just ask tonight, God, that every word that's spoken, Lord, will somehow find its place to the deepest part of our heart. Lord, help the seed tonight, which has been uh, strewn about to be to find a place of planting. Help it to find a place, Lord, where it can find root. It's not about remaking the world in which we live. It's about remaking us in the world in which we live so that we can be prepared for eternity. Master, help us today, this hour, Lord, to look forward to that day of great anticipation when your kingdom will indeed rule and reign in the hearts of every man and woman on the face of this planet. But until that day, Master, I rejoice in the knowledge that your kingdom does rule and reign in my heart and in my life. Master, we thank you, God, for your word. We ask you, Lord, to go with each and every one as we leave this place. Help us to take your word with us. Let us be blessed, encouraged, enlightened, and helped. For we ask it all in the lovely, wonderful name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Praise God and amen.